Welcome to the show. We are live here in Lagos, Niger's commercial capital. It's a morning brief. Welcome back to work as well. I'm Kairo Kikiolu. <laughs> Good morning, Nigeria. Professionals, artisans, whoever you are, the time to repair the roof is now. So don't go back to bed now. <laughs> Wake up <laughs> for your second alarm. Welcome to the Morning Brief on Channels Television. I am Bukola Kouka. Well, don't let them scare you. The good part <laughs> is that you have to just work for four days this week. So that's something to go with. So last week, um, it was four days. This week is four days. So that's something to go with. So don't worry. Uh, let's see how you skill through the first four days of the week and um, enjoy the rest of the weekend as it comes just not too far away from, you know, a few hours, which is if you multiply 24 hours by four. I'm just trying to encourage you that it's not that bad. It's not, it's not that far. Yeah, it's not but, that but far. But Jeffrey, whether we have to work mm -hmm. five days or not, as long as we're building the nation, we should be enthusiastic about working. Don't lose your momentum. Keep at it and you see the results Absolutely. very soon. We just have yeah. to look for a way to help people psychologically <laughs> yes. to get to work. Uh, somebody say they don't like labor. <laughs> However, I want to make it look nice. Mm -hmm. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Welcome to the program. Fantastic, guys. Quick fun fact. You know that Easter Monday is not um, a public holiday in all parts of the world. There are some countries that it's not official. Mm. So if you had maybe Jaguar to Canada, for example, your employer is not obligated officially to grant you that holiday. Some do, some do not in Scotland as well. But this is even the interesting part. Do you know that in a few days, there'll be the Ramadan public holiday? And again, you don't have that across the world. So we need to celebrate the little things in Nigeria. Right. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> right. Christian faithful, Muslim faithful combining to do great things with public holidays. So let's take that beyond public holidays. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, Kayadi. <laughs> Make the most. We're privileged. Make the most of so it. So we have some things to be thankful yes. for. Yeah. Loads of, maybe we, we will do a statistics of how many, but maybe we, we check on the Ministry of Interior. We have quite a number. Uh, I mean, the Women's Day has to, so, let me not go there. Just public holidays, by the way. So we can't do public holidays. There are no holidays on Google. Google, Google I just looked at me. No, I was just joking. I was just joking. Yeah. But we need to count the number of public holidays. Easter, the Ramadan, and the two of it, the Christmas, and all of that. So we need to calculate all of that. Don't forget and the Eid al Malud. That's yeah. also another public holiday. Yes. Uh, the um, Eid al Fitri, Eid al Kabir, October 1. Uh, yes, uh, January 1. May January 29, 1. May 29. June, June 12. 12. So, yeah. The list goes on. If it's fair enough. You see, yeah. one so, of the reasons you need to come to Nigeria. Yeah. We're a tourist attraction for public holidays. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I think we have some good news, however. I, I saw that um, the ladies, or the people, the students, right. that were actually kidnapped, uh, we're just saying that uh, they regained their freedom, according to the police. Like all nine students that were kidnapped in Delta State, uh, we heard that news yesterday and right. quite a disturbing development. Delta from Okwama to the police killing to the army killing and now to this. So I don't know what's going on with Delta security, but this is quite some good news uh, from our correspondent that uh, the students that were kidnapped just yesterday have now regained their freedom. So uh, that is developing story and um, breaking news we're getting right now from our correspondent in Delta State. So the breaking news is the fact that the students that were kidnapped yesterday have now regained their freedom. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So this happened in Ugeli and it got a lot of people thinking, uh, this is not the Northwest, mm -hmm. this is not the Northeast, this is the South South. So we understand that uh, the JTF and Delta State Operation Delta Safe uh, said his troops actually rescued those students. So that's breaking news actually, uh, starting the day on a cherry note. Absolutely. We still have some students uh, were kidnapped, Unical. But not to worry, we'll get you all of those details right here on the show today. We have just about one hour plus, or on the flip side, less than two hours on the show this morning. So let's get into the package that we have for you. We'll start off with the debt management officer's expose on the debt profile of states, particularly those whose governors have spent less than one year in office. But that's our starter today with flags coming in from different quarters. But some of them have been making clarifications about the state of those loans. But what about transparency and accountability and the use of these funds? Well, that is big on our agenda. Add to that, the CBN ordered that banks should increase their value base or recapitalize, which is sending shockwaves down some spines. What we'll find out 
if it is needless or otherwise, after all. And one of the, the issues in contention would be um, the definition of capital base by the CBN and uh, banks are kicking against that. Of course, we'll put all of that into context on the program this morning. But that's not all. We'll also turn our attention to the skies, or at least the people and policies running the aviation sector. Yeah, the regulators and players have come under flak time and again for various lapses, which they blame sometimes on the FX situation. The federal government says, however, it has cleared the backlog for international airlines, but there have been contestations and the local airlines seem not to be having it rosy as ticket prices remain high. So we're looking at that for you as well. Uh, remain high. If you look at those numbers, they are quite high. Yeah. But hey, let's, let's taper things down a little bit. Plus, Nigeria has one of the most vibrant and blossoming creative industry. Uh, industries, but what is creativity without images? Images, everything they say. So, we'll explore those opportunities in that industry, projecting the beauty. I need to say that the beauty of the Nigerian people, yeah. our culture, Absolutely. our food, Great. event tourism, Absolutely. and so much more. In case you don't know, no matter what happens, whether somebody gives birth or somebody passes on, we jolly, we celebrate. But we do that with images. So, a guy whose name will make you say, ooh la la. Incidentally, that's his name. <laughs> He's here to show us how those expressions are put through. Uh, well, there's amazing. another, there's a consonant in front of the la la. Yeah. Really, oh. not who, but his images will make you go, ooh la la. <laughs> <laughs> so don't let, don't let, let's let the image out of the bag yet. I don't know if that's <laughs> I don't know where they're from. <laughs> we'll take that. I know. So join us on the show as well. Don't just watch. Be a part of the show. Send in your questions, comments, and the rest. We have uh, all our social media handles going right across the screen from the WhatsApp number, which you see right there. I think that's revolutionary, actually. We're just a WhatsApp message away. Just imagine that Bukola is a WhatsApp message away from you. Why Bukola? Why? Why, <laughs> why not Bukola? Oh, why kiss. Bukola? Why not you? Bukola, Jeffrey, Kayade. We're just a WhatsApp message away Bukola from you. Bukola is a WhatsApp away. So in case Kayade you... Kayade is mischievous this in, morning. You've got leads, you've got stories, you've got videos. Send it our way. Let us uh, push it out there for you. We're here. <laughs> That's our I can't job, get it man. out of my mind. I know. So let's get started, shall we? We have the top stories for you in just a few seconds. These stories will be shaping the conversation today and in the coming days. So stay with us right here. We're just getting started on the morning break. Let's bring you the top stories at this hour. And we begin with breaking news. It's a cherry one at that. You can call it a happy ending to what had hitherto been a sad story. And we can tell you that all nine of the kidnapped students in Delta State have regained freedom. Breaking news just in. All nine of the kidnapped students in Delta State have regained freedom because gunmen had abducted the nine students as they were traveling along the rainy access of the east-west road in Ogeli North local government area of Delta State. Well, the Delta State Police uh, Public Relations Officer Brighton Daffy, who confirmed the incident, had said that uh, the students uh, were returning from their school in Calabar Cross River State on Friday night when they were abducted uh, from the minibus. And according to him, the driver of the vehicle had also escaped unheard. So that is breaking news that we have for you. The students, nine of them who were kidnapped in Delta State, have now been released. This is a developing story, and we at Channels Television will bring you more updates as they come in. But three students elsewhere, this time of uh, the University of Calabar, Unical as well, Cross River State Capital, uh, have been kidnapped. The three students, according to a source from the school, uh, Ojan Precious Evergen, a 200-level student of Department of Medicine and Surgery, Ugu Chukwemeka, a 300-level student of Department of Genetics and Biotechnology, and Damilola Dixon, a final-year student of the same department. So they were uh, kidnapped probably from their hostels last week. And while the police have been silent on the place of abduction, the police spokesperson in the state, SP Irene Nube, told Channels Television in a phone conversation that the command, alongside other security agencies, is working to ensure the safe release of the three students. 
Well, it's still unclear at this point if those two stories, those two kidnappings are linked. But again, we'll bring you the update as they come in. But away from security now, President Bola Tinubu will be in Senegal today, where he's attending the inauguration of a country's president-elect, Basir Diomaye Faye, which is, of course, taking place today. Now, according to a statement by a special advisor to the president on media and publicity, Ajuri Gilali, President Tinubu, who is a chairman of ECOWAS, a forage of heads of state and government, will join other regional leaders to witness the inauguration at the Diamniado Exhibition Center in Dakar. Well, the president, whose trip is on the invitation of the Republic of Senegal, will be accompanied on the trip by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Yusuf Meitamatugar, and other senior government officials. The president is expected to return to Nigeria after the conclusion of that inauguration uh, today. Now, as a president, it's getting set to attend the inauguration of Senegal's president-elect. Our state house correspondent, Larry Lassisi, takes a look at the tightly contested election that has led to this point and the implication of this presidency for Senegal and the West African region, or the sub-region in this case. A little over a week ago, Senegal witnessed a significant event in its political landscape as opposition candidate, Diomaye Faye, emerged victorious in the presidential elections. Now, this outcome has been hailed as a positive development, not only for Senegal, but also for West Africa as a whole. The presidential elections, initially slated for February the 25th, but postponed indefinitely by President Macky Sall, finally took place on March the 24th, after much anticipation. On the 27th, Mr. Diomaye Faye was officially declared the winner with over 54% of the votes in the first round, making him the youngest president-elect in Senegal's history. Now, this victory sends a strong signal of democratic stability and progress in West Africa, particularly at a time when several member states of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, have been grappling with unconstitutional changes of government. Nigeria's president has commended this development as a testament to the vitality of democracy in the sub-region for the bolstering his stance. As President-elect Faye prepares to assume office and take his oath of office on the 2nd of April, there's optimism that his leadership will bring fresh ideas, energy, and aspirations to Senegal's governance. His presidency is seen as embodying the hopes of the younger generation and may pave the way for a new trend of youthful leadership across Africa, ushering in transformative change. President Bola Tinubu, as chairman of the ECOWAS Commission, will be there in Dakar to welcome him into the ECOWAS fold of heads of government. From Abuja, Landry Lassese for Channels Television News. Well, thanks, Larry. Back home, though, the Easter celebration was not the very best for some amidst the economic realities in the country. Many uh, Christians having a hard time celebrating the season. Well, the increase in pump price of petrol as a result of subsidy removal, inflation and rising food prices, among other factors, have made this year's Easter celebration a bleak one for some members of a Christian community. Well, we spoke to Nigerians across the country from the popular central market in Kaduna State Capital, where prices of foodstuff continue to rise beyond the reach of average Nigerians, to Joss, where traders and customers complain over a high cost of food items, same in Enugu, southeast Nigeria. Check this. I must say things are not easy. Things are not really easy. People are not finding it easy at all. Because I expect that since dollar is, uh, is down, things are supposed to come down. Previous Easter has been good, but this one is we are doing it with, with hardship. Uh, it's not uh, an audacious uh, Easter. Uh, thank God everybody knows the economic reality, the inflation in the country. My family, for instance, we have cut down, cut ourselves to size. The market is not full today. So he was telling me no money in the post. And people that have no money, they cannot come and buy. 
Well, amidst a dire economic situation, some state governments continue to distribute palliatives while the federal government says it has directed the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security to immediately release about 42,000 metric tons of maize, millet and other commodities from the strategic reserves. Let's bring you more stories now. Nigerian army troops deployed for counter-terrorism, counter-insurgency operations in Katsina and Zamfara state have raided terrorist enclaves resulting in the elimination of some terrorists. In a statement posted on X, the army said that in an operation in Zamfara on March the 29th, troops raided the den of a notorious terrorist, Kingpin, Hassan Yantagwai, in the South Bay local government area. Yantagwai and his group have allegedly been responsible for kidnappings and acts of terrorism in some parts of northwest Nigeria. Well, during that operation, Troops overpowered the terrorists in an ensuing gun battle, neutralizing three of them and recovered a large cache of arms and ammunition. Troops also destroyed the terrorist camps. And now to politics. The Northwest Zone of the Old Progressive Congress, APC, is asking members of the opposition party Zamfara State, accusing the Minister of State for Defense, Bella Matawali, of giving palliatives to bandits to come forward with their evidence or risk facing legal action. Addressing a press conference in Kaduna, the APC Northwest Zonal Publicity Secretary, Musa Mada, said that the party welcomes positive criticism from the opposition, but such criticism, he says, should not violate the provisions of freedom of speech. He then accused the PDP this time around, the government in Zamfara of slandering the immediate past government of the state. Well, the Labour Party now, the party group loyal to Lamidi Akpapa has berated the president of the NLC as an Nigerian Labour Congress, Mr. Joe Ajero, over what he described as a legal appointment of Board of Trustee Chairman. Uh, at a press conference in Abel Huta, the state capital, the publicity secretary of the group, Abayo Mirabambi, said the move will disorganize the structure of the party. And he said that the Nigerian Labour Congress has no powers to initiate such pronouncement as stated in Electoral Act 2022, Section 77. So those are some of the top stories that we have for you on the program this morning. We'll be bringing you some more during the course of the show. But it's time uh, to get a, a perspective on what you are saying across social media this morning. Yes, it's been a long weekend, really longer than the usual, plus two days of public holiday. So let's get in your thoughts on the big stories this morning. And Jeffrey, of course, uh, joins me on this one, Jeffrey. Uh, quite brief and straight to the point, yeah. lots of stories, uh, but... Um, we share what the people are actually saying and uh, sometimes what you're saying is not exactly what's on the news mm -hmm. and sometimes what you're saying is what's on the news but we're going to capture all of that today on the program and the first coyote that people are talking about is the reported uh, this sale of three presidential jets uh, to court costs because the federal government appears to be looking inward to yeah. say look what can we do in terms of optimization what can we do to just reduce expenditure as much as possible uh, when I was reading the statement by Jurin Galali that the president is traveling with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and other top government officials. I said, like, can you just go with only the Minister of Foreign Affairs and a few aides and other top, let, it, let them just stay back yeah. because we're trying to save costs. We know Senegal is not that far, but anything that can help us save as much cost as possible. Uh, so let's get to the first uh, post now on X. Adesh Shopee says, so after selling it, where would the money go to and what would they use the money for? That's my take on this. Just wants to know how the money moves. You know, the thing is, we've actually heard this before. This has been said. I think the previous administration also made a move uh, regarding that. So take a look at what Crypto Signals you says. It is encouraging to see steps being taken to trim costs responsibly. Balancing efficiency with prudence is key and stewarding public funds wisely. This user ends by saying. So it's important to be transparent. So let's know who are the other government officials traveling with the president. Yes. Some other government officials is not clear enough. Mm -hmm. At least we know about the Minister of Foreign Affairs. So people can also know who the other people are. So that we know that they are necessary for that right, trip. Right. It's, not, it's not a business engagement. We're yeah. not trying to sign in the bilateral agreement. It's just a ceremony to usher in a new administration. So if the president can go with three people yeah. and some security officials, it's fine. That's fair enough. Uh, Sinesco says, good. They should use the money to buy drones to track the terrorists. I am talking about real drones, not <laughs> Walmart drones. I don't know what that is. Okay, he's a tech man. We will to explain the difference. <laughs> Come on, of course not. Any drone used for security wouldn't be that kind of drone. I imagine you're saying a toy drone or whatever. But yeah, point taken. Uh, it's very interesting. Take a look at this one from Emmy Duru saying, 
Now, you need to get this post in its entirety. Don't run with the first line. So it starts by saying we don't need any presidential, presidential jets. jets. But if you can reduce the fleet to two, then he will be doing Nigeria a massive favor. So I guess saying we don't need a lot. That's why it's jets in the first place, because mm. we know that these things are necessary. Yeah. Let's not uh, be too extreme now yes. when we're talking about these issues. So yeah, that's the context right there. Yeah, we can't reduce our president to traveling by... <laughs> Maybe Marwa or something. No, you can't get that bad. You need the jet, so <laughs> as much as possible. But we understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, Adekunle Adiola says, buy commercial airlines, airplanes, rather, and start more international flights to various destinations. It will strengthen the economy, more jobs, and more opportunities. All right, so, yeah. yeah. There you go. By the way, we have a big conversation on the aviation sector this morning, so stick around. We'll be taking a look at some of these issues and some of the ones that concern you. You may not be on that presidential jet, but there are some other flights you have been in, you will be in, and you are probably in already. But let's turn our attention to another form of transportation. This is not transporting humans, but crude oil. And mm. it's concerning pipeline vandalism. And there are some sort of, uh, well, what I call it proposals in place for the federal government to maybe transport crude oil via trucks. A lot of things are coming to mind right now. But let's see what you're saying. AGO 4 Church says, using trucks cannot solve the problem they could be diverted or blocked by armed men. No nation grows by corruption. So let state control their resources, then there will be economic growth and prosperity. Uh, the stealing of our crude oil, let, let's not kid ourselves, is that industrial skill. Oh, yeah. If you've ever been close to a pipeline, you know it's not for petty thieves. It has to be some level of sophistication for it to happen. <laughs> when those infractions happen, about 9,000 of them, over 100 kilometers by 300. So the NMPC has given us these figures. We have yeah. them, and it's quite sad. It is. Um, Olawale says, how hard is it to monitor pipelines with technology available in 2024? Big question. How does transporting crude via trucks make sense? It's even more expensive than what you lose to vandals. Is risk, the risks are more and the threats of theft higher. Securing pipelines can't be this hard. Oh, there you go. So that particular line or proposal was contained in a presentation by the NUPRC yeah. saying that we're looking at these alternatives. So it is not a policy yet. It's not been approved yet. But these are things uh, that are put out there and it's important for you to let your thoughts be heard. Uh, we have more uh, from Sadiq Shitu uh, saying the federal government should do it <laughs> so as to reduce oil thieves in the Niger Delta region. But you know, this is a big debate really. Will this now basically be putting it uh, closer to those who want to maybe uh, mm -hmm. steal it by you know, taking it via road? Don't forget yeah. what happens on the road sometimes. But those are some of the angles there. And uh, Yemi Olajide says, Yemi Olajide 8 says, um, let me find out, yeah. What about billions paid to Antita Security? Actually, they are paid four billion a month. Uh, thinking outside the box is a problem, except thinking of corruption just to provide chop for the trucks. Orders, cabals, despite destruction of roads due to pressure by heavy duty trucks. Um, what's the current? Katerians operate pipelines, yet we refuse to learn. Hmm. Okay. There's a lot of lashing this morning. Uh, but let's switch gears now. Let's show you a video. Now, this video is from Kebby. And I don't want you to link this to the proposal about transporting crude via road, but this video is uh, showing some residents looting a truck, uh, a broken down truck uh, loaded with assorted grains meant for distribution and burning Kebby. So those are the images you're seeing. You can see that truck uh, just about 100 meters away from uh, the person shooting that video. You see a crowd of people approaching. Yes, this is this is really sad. This is this is this is, this is unacceptable. That exactly. We understand there's hunger in the land and all of that. We don't know whether these trucks are for the government or for the private uh, individual who owns this business. But if it's for, an, it's for if it's for the private person or an investor, um, just seeing your investment just being carted away like this is really really sad. And this is the response uh, we're getting on X. Fizi says. This is really absurd and wickedness. Hunger is not an excuse. Full stop. Uh, cheaper in Kebi. Okay. Maybe that person lives in Kebi still. Well, um, and I know we've heard some of those uh, narratives. Another person uh, saying that um, 
that I'm supremo saying this is sad news and this might not be due to hunger. Some people just see opportunities in bad things. And it's been said that that uh, particular truck or the grains on it were actually meant for distribution. Okay. But should have waited for it to get to its destination before uh, forceful distribution. This is... Right. All right. Uh, so... Let's see, Avocado says, the level at which people are going to satisfy their needs is just unbelievable. Mm. Uh, this will not happen in the Western world. If the change we want will come, it'll start with us. Those involved should be brought to book. Another angle from Nelson claimed some other figures saying that this palliative, or palliatives in this case, are meant for distribution to citizens, but it wasn't distributed before now. Well, mm. again, who knows what the shedling is? We need more information on that. But exactly, if of course it wasn't distributed at the right time, then that's another uh, or another set of questions to be answered by those in charge. There's another interesting one you're talking about, which is of interest to everyone, because when we had the director of works here, we did make a proposal that if these installations and national assets are being stolen, let's begin with the basics. True. Uh, CCTV, uh, FG installing CCTV solar light on third mainland oh, bridge. Yeah, that's got a lot that of proposal, people. it got everybody, literally. A lot of people talking. This is, uh, this is from um, Narroscope, says, the device is long overdue on the third mainland bridge. We call it 3MB. Uh, now that it is finally here, we need to devise a method to protect and put it on operation at all times. Very important. At all times, so that yeah. there's lights. I noticed on the Long Bridge, mm -hmm. uh, inward Lagos as mm -hmm. well, on outward, you might notice some street lights mm -hmm. as well. And it was cherry to see, yes, your headlamps do a lot, but it's always good to see some of those blind spots, see there's someone lurking in the corner. This next one is from Crypto Signals. You say balancing safety with sustainability is key in our infrastructure project. And I think that's talking about uh, the solar essentially. So that's another angle uh, that we picked to this one. Yeah, so that it doesn't, doesn't go off at any time. We watch videos online when we see incidents and the government goes to every CCTV yeah. around the area to be able to find out and investigate. And um, this is coming from Polozma. Uh, Polisma says it should be installed all over the country and not just the third mainland bridge alone. We really need that in this country as part of security measures. I agree totally. I agree. You know what's quite interesting as well, Jeffrey? Uh, the conversation around who approved it, who should take the glory for this. Is it the previous administration? Is it the current administration? So one moment we say government is a continuum. The next, people are saying, well, no, you need to separate these administrations. <laughs> While that debate is ongoing, what is important, we, we need to ensure that we have one of the very best infrastructure because that's what we deserve Absolutely. as a people. There is more on that uh, saying that um, they should stick to the electric powered lights because they are brighter. That's from Raf underscore Ike. So Raf's grouse is about the fact that it's solar. He says that electric might be better. Imagine driving when you can't see two poles ahead of you. Well, I haven't driven since <clears throat> this installation at night, so I, I won't be able to speak to it. I won't be able to speak to it, but the most important thing is illumination. Let there be light. Mm. That's what we want. So I guess the person understands what he or she is saying. And I think electricity, solar is also electricity, so it's yeah. just the, the source. So uh, maybe you're saying is it diesel powered, is it uh, petrol, or should just come from the power grid? I mean, I'm even thinking whether the person is complaining about the distance between a pole and the other. That, I That's wouldn't know thing. what you're saying, but uh, Suleiman Uma says, this is a waste of money because it will not work and will not last. Criminals will vandalize them. It happened in Abuja. <laughs> Come on, be a bit optimistic for a moment. Yeah. But you know Let's the be truth. optimistic for a moment. You can't blame some Nigerians. They have I seen things. The Abuja totally. CCTV project is still out there in the air somewhere. But these are the big stories you are talking about we're big uh, on your comments as well we'll take a moment now and when we return we'll start with the starter for the day it's a big conversation it concerns money money for you money for the economy money for states that's a big one you don't want to miss so in about five ten seconds we're back so stay with us it's the morning brief
get started with our conversation, shall we? We're turning our attention uh, to some of the big stories that concern the economy at the sub-nationals. And even when it comes to the banking sector, we have joining us to walk us through those very important talking points. Dr. Nemeka Obiariri, who's a development economist and investment banking executive. He joins us uh, via Zoom from right here in Lagos. Good morning, sir. Welcome to the Morning Brief. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And I'll just start with the big one, and that's the fact that recently the DMO released documents uh, showing the debt profile across board, the states, the FCT, and the federal government. But what caught the attention of a lot of people uh, is the debt incurred, said to have been incurred, by 13 new state governors, and they've not even spent one year in office. And that has brought up that classic debate yet again. Why borrow in the first place? Is that a good thing? Some say, well, you can't do without borrowing. You just need to be transparent and accountable to the people. Some say these states have a huge debt burden already. I mean, you had the governor of Kaduna State talking about what he inherited from the previous governor. So uh, walk us through this new data we're seeing. What do you see when you look at it? Uh, basically, uh, the question we should be asking ourselves is what did they borrow to invest in? Uh, debt itself or leveraging is not bad in the real sense of it. You borrow to invest in critical infrastructure. You borrow to invest in projects that will yield returns, that will enable you to repay back your loan, the interest portion, and at least stimulate economic activities. <laughs> Basically, the question we should be asking this governor is, what are they borrowing for? If you know, they will, they will normally cite if you ask this usual classical economy, they will tell you, Oh, um, South Africa has a standard debt of 78 billion dollars, um, US has a standard debt that is uh, almost 100 percent of their GDP. They will cite Japan, but these guys forgot that these borrowings were not borrowed to consume or to loot, they borrowed it to invest. And you can see the revenue in South Africa last year alone, their total revenue was almost about 126 billion dollars. And we simply mean Cetaris Paribus. The South Africans can decide to liquidate their external loan within nine months. In the case of Nigeria, we've been borrowing and frittering the money away. I'll give another example. Ethiopia Djibouti borrowed $4.5 billion to do 754 kilometers standard gauge rail line through atrocious landscape, mountainous landscape, at a cost of $5.9 million, million per kilometer. And even the Ethiopians queried such magnitude of investment. They felt it was riddled with corruption. What was the sort of investment to create a pathway into the sea? Because Ethiopia is landlocked, to enable them to stimulate economic activities and evacuate their goods and services and exports. Case of Nigeria, 156 kilometer Lagos to Ebadore project. Landscape that is smooth, not atrocious. We, 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 we borrowed $1.9496 billion at an average cost of $12.9 billion million dollars per kilometer by the same Chinese, the same Chinese technology. What does that show you? The World Bank standard says average cost of a kilometer of a standard rail project is $3.5 million. That simply means in case of Nigeria, we borrowed atrociously. We did our own road at a cost of almost 250% of the Ethiopians. So the question is, what are we borrowing to do? The 23 trillion naira that was printed and frittered away, that is causing the problem we have under Buhari. If we had invested that 23 trillion in agriculture, today we'll have created nothing less than 3 million jobs and we'll be generating nothing less than 33 trillion naira into this economy annually for what will happen. But the problem is that they borrowed, they shared, they looted, and they consumed. So it is worrisome. Borrowing in itself is not a problem. But you must borrow to invest in critical assets that will yield your return on the same currency you borrowed or that will catalyze economic activities in every sector of the economy that will enable you to generate productive activities that will earn enough revenue to pay back the debt and the interest and stimulate economic activities. Today, total national debt profile is $107 trillion, up from $12 trillion as of June 30th, 2015. External debt is up by forty-three trillion, forty-three billion dollars, up from ten billion dollars as of June thirtieth, twenty fifteen. We are not talking about the way I missed that is with three trillion naira plus seven trillion naira accumulated interest. 
and the $10 trillion that was wasted through diverse intervention mechanisms that did not yield any results. That is what we are grappling today. And that is what you see in Mr. Cardoso with the limited options available to him, trying to see how he can manipulate and manage the monetary policy rates to be able to achieve. Yeah, please go ahead. So that is it. Right. So for us to grow this economy, we must borrow tight to assets. I give you an example. I, I, I do not know the rationale for us to borrow to do rail projects from Kano to Maradi. When we have the most lucrative rail route in Nigeria, which is the Lagos, Shagamu, Ijebode, Ore, um, Benin, Asaba, Onicha, Owere, to Potako, Sebko back to Umaya, Aba, back to Okiwe, to Enugu, to Abakeleke, to Onicha. Now, it is already proven through research that road, the southwest, southeast railroad, south south railroad, has a, 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 a tonnage traffic, cargo traffic of about two annually. It has a passenger traffic of almost about 500 million passenger traffic annually. If you run the numbers, today the average cost per ton per mile of cargo transport within that route is almost about 120 naira per cargo per ton mile. If we do that rail route on an annual basis, that rail route will catalyze economic activities that will result in nothing less than $5 billion revenue within the axis. If we decide to borrow $6.5 billion to do that rail, rail route, which is about, about 1,085 kilometers, in, in seven years, under a design, build, operate, and transfer arrangement, federal government of Nigeria will underwrite it. If we do it, 45 years DBOT, in seven years, investors will recover their monies. It's a lucrative rail route. If we use it and link it to the coastal rail route that will cover the whole of West Africa, Nigeria, under the actual framework, will use it to be the hub for the whole of West Africa. But those who borrow should be thinking critically. Borrowing is very good. But you must borrow against assets. You must borrow against projects. You must borrow against activities that will catalyze productivity and be able to repay those. And that is one, one that is not what we are having today in Nigeria across the three tiers of government. So are you questioning the quality of leadership and their understanding of basic economics? You see, it's, it's not just questioning. It's, it's the lack of patriotism. It's the lack of sincerity behind the borrowing. I'll give you another example. One of the reasons why we have yet trapped with peasant families is because we have not mechanized agriculture across the 8,809 electoral ward. There was a proposal we raised in 2019 when the Buhari government muted the idea of borrowing $1.1 billion to import 10,000 tractors, we shared with them a proposal. We have been talking to a lot of Chinese companies. China today has over 98% full self-sufficiency. China has some of the biggest agro-value chain in China. And we've been talking to some Chinese firms who are very bullish in tractor and bulldozer manufacturing. And they are willing to come to Nigeria to set up an assembly plant. And we shared it with those in power then. And what was the whole idea? These guys will set up an assembly plant in Nigeria that can do CKDs. And then they, they will supply both tractor and the D7 bulldozer, the Chinese equivalent, at an early cost of $82,000. Tractor and bulldozer and all the accessories. And they will train Nigerians, and the clusters will be done under PPP arrangement that will enable us to cultivate about 15 million hectares of new upstream farm gates. This, this current government now, we just saw the Minister for Agri repeating the same mistake the Buhari government did, signing a MOU to import 10,000 tractors under a public sector arrangement that will cost the same $1.1 billion, billion. Does it make sense to you that we can spend $750 million? and import both tractor and bulldozer. And somebody is trying to spend $1.1 billion to import only tractor. Does this make sense to you? And that is the kind of things we see in Nigeria. Under the structure that we shared with them, that will be controlled through the Nigeria Sovereign Wealth Investment Authorities, you will have agro clusters in all the, each of the 8,000, 8,000 electoral ward that will be managed by thoroughly trained mechanical engineers. Farmers within those clusters will hire those machines, 
use it in their farm gate at an average cost of not more than 40,000 naira per acre. And when you do it, you will stimulate economic activities, you will grow jobs, you will add over 50 billion um, dollars to Nigeria economy, and those loans can be repaid within three years or five years. But these guys in power, I feel sorry for, but I always say it, the president is not omnipresent, the president is not omniscient. Bible says in Proverbs 25.5, if you surround a king with wicked people, then we even force a righteous king to do wickedly. But if you surround a king with wise men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they will guide him to govern well. How can a minister in Nigeria today want to repeat the same mistake that happened under the Buhari chief? It's something we should be asking ourselves. Mr. Biari, the question is, are we seeing these um, uh, evidence of infrastructure development uh, in spite of the borrowings? And it's quite concerning, really, because the report says 13 new governors have borrowed to the tune of 226.8 billion naira in six months alone. And they have increased um, earnings from the FAC allocation by about 40 to 50 percent, according to re uh, the report uh, coming from uh, uh, so, do you see the justification for these increased uh, borrowing, despite the fact that they have increased FAC allocation? And then if you also consider uh, the excuse that some of them are presenting, that they're recording increase in internally generated revenue. The question is, despite all of that, do they have a strong debt-to-payment ratio, uh, uh, a terminology that there we is, often use? There is, there is no justification. And, and it's so disheartening. You know, we always put so much emphasis at the center without looking at what happened at the subnational level, which is where the focus should be, because there are those nearer to the grassroots. I was privileged to speak to the PDP Governors Forum in 2019, and I shared with them an audacious vision on how they can grow agro wealth that will enhance security and curb desertifications in such a very scientific way that they can generate almost about $12.5 billion annually for one cash crop. And I will share it with you guys if time permits me. Saudi Arabia, as wealthy as they are in the oil area, in 2006 decided to develop the date palm plantation, which the Bible calls, when Bible talked about a land flowing with milk and honey, the milk has to do with dairy products. The honey is from the date foods. From 2016 now, Saudi Arabia has developed over a million hectares of the date plantation. Is, Egypt is 95% desert. Egypt has almost about 1.7 million hectares of the dates. And they generate billions of dollars from that. I shared with them very audacious, simple plan. Nigeria is the only place in the whole wide world where the date plantation grows in the wild and fruits twice in a year. The 19 northern states, I share with the governors, even if you borrow, if you go to Aki Wuna additional today and say we want to borrow 100, 100 million dollars to focus on this, cultivating 50,000 hectares in every of the 19 northern states. In the next, I told them by 2019, if they do it in that 2020, by 2024, 2025, they will have developed 1 million hectares. They will have developed over 1,250 factories where it will be processed. And these agro parks will also be used to do infrastructure, pipe on water, to collocate the herdsmen, so that will, they will not be nomadic because they have been making excuses that is because there is no vegetation for them. Under this arrangement, they will create 2 million jobs, direct jobs. They will create nothing less than 12,000 factory jobs. They will have 25 motorized, fully armed agro rangers in every of these 1,250 clusters. And then they will generate on an annual basis $12.5 billion. Because as of today, a ton of the dead food is about $2,800. And a hectare does about 20 tons. This red, despite the fact that they have 95% desert, that is what they are doing. It's a $23 billion market that is expected to grow at a cumulative great, uh, gross average uh, 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 um, growth rate of almost about 7.5% into the next 20 years. But these guys are not thinking that way. Go and look at what happened in Qatar State. Right. $585 million borrowed by the past governor, plus $85 billion naira. Ask him to show you what he did with that money. Right. And that is the most painful thing here. And Nigerians are not asking questions. I expect the average Nigerian to look inward. In the Southeast, it's the same thing. The palm oil industry used to be a, used to contribute 45% of the global palm oil market in Nigeria in 1965. Michael, but as a 39-year-old man, 
premier act of Eastern Nigeria, developed 214 kilometer industrial belt and built that industrial belt using the palm oil. I shared with the governors of the Southeast on how they can, under a simple PPP arrangement that does not cost them a cup of Fak and Jack, how they can develop 1,126,000 1, new Tehana palm plantations across each of the 1,460 uh, electoral wards. Well, Dr. Berry, if I, if I may now, that there's so much brilliant ideas coming out of this conversation. And I mean, some will say Nigeria is not, I mean, we're not lacking in ideas, in the brilliant minds. Even those in government will tell you that, well, I know what I've done outside of government in the private sector. These ideas uh, I have worked on and they've been successful. And those people have been co-opted into government. And I imagine some of them will disagree with you uh, when you say that well, they are those responsible for this because they are the ones surrounding those in government. They will say, well, we give the ideas, we give the advice. It's only left to those in power to implement them or otherwise. I know the Zamfara state governor uh, has spoken about uh, the debt as well, saying, well, this is from the previous administration, the 20 billion bond or something like that. But let's dig deeper because some of these loans, in fact, a good number of them, always get the approval of the federal government, you know, the National Assembly before they are taken. So it, most times it's not just the state governments uh, that are involved in this in that sense. There's an approval process. They look at it, whether or not you're viable to repay back, uh, what it is you're tying those loans to. The question now is whether or not they are transparent. But let's also segue into the banking sector because, of course, the loans are sometimes gotten from the banking sector. Now, they have a serious issue on their hands, recapitalization. Yes, it is two years. Uh, they have two years to do that. Uh, but there are concerns. One, uh, saying the modus operandi, or at least uh, some of the uh, some of the, uh, the, the requirements from the CBN are uh, saying that you cannot put this in, it has to be strictly this. Uh, some say, well, that might be a tough ask, but you are involved in this sector. What do you see uh, with this recapitalization process? You see, the, the problem we have in Nigeria is that we tackle the symptoms and not the root cause of the problem. The problem we have in Nigeria is not because the banks are not properly capitalized. The problem we have in Nigeria is because the institutions of the state, the financial service delivery transmission mechanism is not doing what they're supposed to do. In 2005, when we embarked on this same assignment of recapitalizing the banks, we had a stable economy under Olusegun Obasanjo, an economy that was growing as about 6.65% per annum GDP. We had a middle class that was very buoyant, 4 million strong middle class. We, we had its reforms left and right, and everything was going well. And if you look at that time, as of January 2005, when 25 banks purportedly or allegedly met the requirements, our GDP there was about $175 billion. And if you look at the capitalization that time, it came to about $4.7 billion. They are about, which is about 2% of GDP. The problem we have is not recapitalizing the banks. The problem we have is that we have not yet fix the institutions of the state to be able to drive economic. This one of the reasons the CBN gave was that ah, they want to recapitalize the banks in preparation for their plan to grow a one trillion dollar economy. That does not make sense. You don't need the banks to recapitalize. What you need is financial inclusion and to strengthen the financial, the institutional space, institutions of the state for capital mobilization. If you want to mobilize capital for economic development, it's not the banks. What the banks simply do is financial intermediation trying to bridge the gap, trying to bring together the surplus economic units and the deficit economic units, to market money market activities. If you want to grow the economy, you look at those institutions that can help you drive long-term huge ticket capital. And that is where the capital market comes in. That is where the pension fund industry comes in. Look at the issue of the US, look at South Africa, look at Mexico. As of 2005, South African GDP was 280 billion Dollars. Their capital market then was about two point eight billion dollars. <throat> Today, the South African capital market is three hundred and twenty six percent of their GDP, one point two trillion dollars. Nigerian capital market today is just about forty five billion dollars, less than ten percent of our GDP. And you are talking about recapitalizing the bank. There is no Nigerian that is saying that we we'll go to the capital market to subscribe for shares based on the experiences we have had in this market, especially in the late twenties. 
We saw what happened between 2008 and 2010. Artisans, bricklayers, motorcycle uh, car riders, taxi drivers mobilize their funds to invest in the capital market. At the end of the day, most of those funds were frittered away. People took those monies, walked away, and nothing happened. I know of a friend who invested all his life savings, his retirement benefits, working 20 years during and gas industry, in that alliance insurance, in IGI, in, 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 in uh, uh, AIT placement. Today, that one lost, he's, he's back to proper stage because nothing happened. Those guys walked away with those monies. We need to fix the institutions of Nigeria to be able to mobilize capital. Go to the US, go to South Africa, go to Mexico. You strengthen the capital market. You drive financial inclusion. Today, Nigeria has a huge informal market. What we should be talking about is not capitalizing the big banks. What we should be talking about is how we can grow micro credit, how we can take credit to the rural areas in the US. If you look at, I took our time to study economies. In the US today, most of the institutions that fund agri, that fund the rural economy, are not the commercial banks. They are agro credit agencies. And some of these guys, they do almost about 389 billion dollars, 25 billion dollars, 134 billion dollars. Go to Indonesia, go to Malaysia, go to Singapore, look around you. You know, this fixation of forcing <coughs> banks to recapitalize and telling them not what to do, it doesn't make sense. As of 2022, Access Bank shareholders fund was about $1.2 billion, uh, $1.2 trillion. Naira. Senate Bank was $1.3 trillion, uh, trillion Naira. GDP was $932 billion um, um, and Naira. And now somebody is telling them, you cannot use your return any. Somebody made a profit and said, okay, I'm not going to spend this money. I want to keep it in my safe. And now you're telling them they cannot use it to recapitalize. And you expect ghosts from the moon to bring money and bring it to the industry because the investors are not wise. They are not looking at you. So, they are not seeing what is happening in the market. So, Nigeria to fix our institutions. If we want to grow our GDP to $1 trillion in the next five years, is the easiest thing we can do, but so, not through this food that fully. So, so let, let's get to that specific that you just mentioned now and what options are left for the banks. Because initially when we heard the news, they said, okay, the full guys, they're already in a good footing. But... With that provisor, it's quite difficult right now. They say for existing banks, I want to read that provision that you stated in passing. The minimum capital specified above shall comprise paid up capital and share premium only. For the avoidance of doubt, the new capital requirement shall not be based on shareholders fund. Now that the bank, uh, the Apex Bank has put this forward, I know you broadly spoken on what should be done. This is not the first, uh, this is not the, uh, necessarily what, sh what will revamp or rebate the economy, but now the CBN has given this directive. So let's walk around the policy of the CBN. What is left to the bank now that this has to be less of shareholders? Fund? Very, very, very simple. The banks will summon their shareholders, a, 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 a general, general meeting of their shareholders, approve and, and pay out their dividends. It's their money. You cannot tell them. It's like me. I have 100 million naira. Maybe I have 20 million naira in any bank. I have 30 in GT Bank. I have. Um, 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 the balance is public IBTC. And I want to purchase something. And I'm telling somebody, I'm going to transfer 1 million from Zenit, 1 million from UC. Then the man will be telling me, oh, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want any transfer from GT. Money is fungible. You cannot determine for me what I will do with my money. What these banks will simply do is to call an extraordinary general meeting. Get their banks, they are, most of them are listening to the floor of the exchange. Get their approval of their shareholders to pay dividend. They will pay dividend payout of 80% of what they have in their return earning. When they pay out those dividends, they will not go back and they do raise a, a new share offering. And those investors will subscribe back. Because one, if I if I have a if I'm a I'm an investor in a bank that pay me huge dividends, of course I will be motivated to invest more in that bank. So that is the truth. And we, we should be very careful here. And even if all the banks recapitalize, let us even assume their whole interest of trying to do this is to see if they can attract foreign direct investors that will come and subscribe to the bank shares, which we know is not going to work. What they are attracting today is FPI because they do, if average investor outside there sees the fundamentals, know the fundamentals. Assuming if all the 24 banks will capitalize to 500 billion naira each, without considering, highest we will attract here will be about five billion dollars in nominal in real terms. Five billion dollars in this economy will amount to nothing. We have a global development master plan. 
that requires us to have consistent capital investment of about hundred billion dollars in this economy. If we want to grow this economy to become a one trillion dollar economy, it's not by asking bank to recapitalize with banks. Banks do not mobilize long term funds. What uh -huh. banks do do is. And you know, Mr. Biare, sorry, let, let me let me come in there. You, you have very, very um, maverick views that are a departure from the norm since the CBN under this new regime announced uh, the policy, the proposition of recapitalization. Others who have aligned with the CBN's view uh, you know, uh, agreeing with the concern that because of the erosion of the value of the Naira, uh, you know, and uh, as against uh, uh, the, the value of the Naira is against the dollar. You know, but uh, the question now is, because uh, there's a report that says that top 10 Nigerian banks have assets net worth to the tune of about 70 trillion Naira. So the question now is, what is the growth of the capital adequacy ratio over the period of time since the last recapitalization and the ratio of non-performing loans, which was the concern at that time? What, what is the growth rate you know, of those two um, issues? And if they have grown over the years, do we still need to recapitalize? The, the truth of the matter is that that was not even the reason why the CBN had them to recapitalize. The extract tests have been carried and the banks in Nigeria are very healthy. There is no bank in Nigeria that is not very healthy. And if you even look at the balance sheet of the banks, you discover that most, those of, most of those banks are not creating risk assets. And that is why the CBN and the fiscal managers also come in here. If you want the banks to lend, you have to, you have to, you have to carry out massive institutional and regulatory reforms, legislative reforms, to be able to de-risk assets, to 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 de-risk the system. Today we have a land use act that makes it so cumbersome to transfer land, which is a very very valuable asset in terms of borrowing. If you go to any bank now to borrow money, if you don't have any land in Ikoi or VI or Abuja, you will not borrow. Even if you have a land in Owere or Abakeleke that are prime properties, they won't take it as collateral. Because of the issue, we expect the government of the day to amend the constitution, amend the relevant laws, to make the ease of transferability of the land assets very, very easy. To make laws that will, that will, that will de-risk borrowing in the system to enable the banks to lend. Today, in at Amco, we have over 5 trillion naira. Right. Toxic assets that we acquired from the banks. Amco was supposed to last for five years. Today, is almost 15 years old. 20%, 65% of that 5 trillion toxic assets are owned by 20 people. Right. And most of these guys are governors today. Some of them are senators. Nothing has been done to them. They are the ones ruling Nigeria. So how do you expect banks when 5 trillion naira has not been recovered? You ask, go and check their returns. Most of the profit they declared last year were FX-related profits. Well, Dr. Until Gary. we do the right things, right. the banks cannot let where they should learn. Interesting perspective. We've heard some of the uh, some of these uh, banks, well, at least from some of the officials, saying, "Well, they're in good stead," and they're upbeat about this, saying they will meet that target. Some even say they might surpass yeah. it. But you've raised a vital point: consequences, and, and that's something we need to tidy up. If there's an infraction, if something wrong is done, there needs to be the appropriate consequences. Quite a very interesting conversation we've had with you this morning. We'd like to thank you uh, for these insights, uh, proven uh, quite vital. We've been speaking with Dr. Nemeka Obiareri, who is a development economist and investment banking executive. I, I know you have a busy day ahead, so thank you for sharing your time with us. I wish you a great day ahead. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Ooh, wow, the economy is always a very hot one. Yes, it concerns our money, so we better pay a lot of attention to it. But we'll shift gears now. We'll talk about the aviation sector. There's been a lot of chatter uh, about that sector of late. And we'll talk about some of those big talking points, the FX situation, uh, safety in that sector, the price of tickets, and the performance of the players. That's in a few seconds. Stay with us. Welcome back to the program. We'll talk about that backlog clearance by the federal government and the dispute over whether or not it has been done. We're being joined by Mr. Bankoli Bernard, 
is chairman of many things, Association of Airline Training Organization of Nigeria, uh, Chairman Airline and Passenger Joint Committee and Chairman Finglo Holdings. He joins us via Zoom. Mr. Uh, Bennett, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you very much. Good morning. Let, let's begin with uh, clearing the gray areas, which is uh, we, we got the news about the central bank saying, look, uh, the obligations uh, that we owe in terms of backlogs have been cleared. But later on, we saw these headlines where some airlines are saying shows receipts as to this. Uh, some said that the last time I checked, it remains at status quo. Is there an update to that effect? Well, I think there is misconception and miscommunication in regard to um, FX issues concerning the airlines. The first thing is when you follow the CBM policies that allow the, the, the foreign airlines to source for their efforts from the central bank by doing forward bidding and all that, that is the backlog that has been cleared. So as it stands today, all verifiable efforts demand from CBN has been cleared. So the CBN is not in any way indebted, indebted to any foreign airlines in terms of their Naira funds, which they've used to bid for FX. So that's one angle. Then the second, the second angle is the Naira that the foreign airlines have with the commercial banks. And you remember when the the, the regime of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu came in, the Naira was floated, and everyone was asked to go and source for their ethics through the IME window. So their inability to use the Naira they have to source for the um, ethics through the IME window as a result of rate differentials, I don't think is the responsibility of CBN. And I don't think there's anything anybody can do about it. Business is all about profit and loss. There are times that you make profit and there are times that you make loss. So I think as an airline, they are left with the option to then cut their losses and move on and start to trade. I think that's the rightful thing to, to, to do <clears throat> rather than this back and forth of what CBN has done and or what CBN has not done. CBN has done the needful. Let us start to speak the right narrative about our country. CBN has cleared the backlog of the airlines. So why, why, why do they hold that view about the trap funds and why is it making that much of a headline? Well, it's a, a, a new sensation because they know that the, the journalists will out, will out the information for them. They have to give reasons why they're doing certain action of theirs. Now, that backlog, which they've been unable to repatriate, not as a result of CBN inability to provide them with the funds, but, the, but as a result of uh, uh, the devaluation of our Naira asset where that made the exchange rate at which they sold and at, at the rate at which they're about to re remit to be different is the loss they're not willing to take. So they, they, they have to take a decision and take a decision very fast. Based on that, we've seen restriction of airfare to more expensive fares on the, on, the, on the GDS. And with the more expensive fares on the GDS, Nigerians have been put through the pay to be able to recoup some of the losses that they would have made from the previous sales they've made. So in the real sense of it, I think we all have to come to the round table and say, hey, look, yes, the Naira has been devalued. We don't have money with CBN. We've got our money with um, our commercial banks. Let us cut our losses and move on. That's what business is all about. But us maintaining status quo that, oh, the government was still at a particular rate to us, I don't think is an ideal position.
Well, um, if I'm not mistaken, the CBN governor had said that uh, the, all the backlog had been cleared and anything else that uh, the foreign airlines were still claiming uh, cannot be verified, especially after the audit. So perhaps uh, the foreign airlines may need to present uh, alternative or superior evidence to prove indeed that $700 million is being owed. But uh, away from that uh, exactly. part, part of the conversation now, uh, to the... Uh, increasing cost of uh, local ticket fares. Uh, we've seen uh, the landing safely of uh, a, for a, a local airline in London, which was celebrated and made great uh, excitement. And that's another part of the conversation uh, because, you know, that defied all of the administrative bottlenecks of uh, local airlines plying uh, the Western space. We'll get to that part of the conversation. But one thing that is also being celebrated there is the reduced cost, you know, of that fare to London. Why are we not seeing the same reduction in ticket fares for local travel? Well, um, you will agree with me that um, it's actually very expensive doing business in Nigeria. It's actually very, very expensive. The cost of doing business in Nigeria compared to the rest of the world, um, it's alarming. And that's one of the things that's probably going to um, um, discourage uh, foreign investors from coming to this kind of business climate because they could possibly do this business somewhere else and make their money and their money will be saved. So we have to come to a reasonable point to say, can we look at the policies that drives the aviation industry? Can we look at a way of ensuring that certain things are made available? The taxes on, on airline, uh, or on, on aircraft parts, can we look at it? Can we look at the cost of operations, the charges coming from the government? By the time we look at all those things, trust me, the airfare that you probably get in Nigeria will be as competitive as what you're getting anywhere around the world. The cost of operating an airline in Nigeria is astronomical. And that is what is making the airline increase the airfare and it looks like the service does not commensurate with um, uh, their counterparts around the world. Take for instance, there's a charge on every ticket. It's called passenger service charge. It's being charged on international airlines, international uh, airlines and local airlines. Local fare, international fare pay what we call passenger service charge. On this passenger service charge, it's about ten dollars for local fare for local fares, about um, uh, fifty dollars on international fares. Now the question is this: When government takes these charges, what is being done with it? Certain services should have been provided for not just the uh, uh, passengers, but for the airlines as well. But they are getting little or nothing from the government. So if airfares are high, it's not as a result of the local carriers wanting to just hike the fare, it's as a result of excess levies and taxes on, on operating within our lo local space. Mm. It, it, it costs about 45% of the total airfare that is being used right. for 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 charges, um, for taxes, levies, and and um, aviation fuel. Right. So when you look at it, what are the what are the airlines left with? They are left with little or nothing. Otherwise, you will have seen quite a number of people coming up with different airlines with the population that we have in Nigeria. But it's a bit difficult. So first thing first, the government even needs to look into the policy that regulates the aviation industry. Well, Mr. Bernard. How can we... Yeah. Uh, pardon me, just to... I need to align uh, my question with a point you just raised. That's why I, I butt in. And you've said time and again that it's tough doing business in Nigeria. You've talked about how much 
these um, airlines have to incur and what little will be left at the end of the day. And it just takes me back to the first question which we asked about the clearing or not of the FX backlog. You're a business person as well, and, and perhaps for a minute, put yourself in the shoes of some of these airlines that are contesting and saying, well, we sold the tickets at this price when the FX was this, and now you're saying that we should get our FX at a lower rate. So obviously, they're making a loss in an already difficult business climate. And I think that is the angle they're coming from that, is it fair? They did business, provided service at a premium, but we're being asked to take our FX at a lower rate. Do, 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 you, do you at least have a feel of, of their own perspective? Uh, let us be fair and fair is fair. We must not subject ourselves to exploitation. It's, it's very necessary that we make things clear here. Now, as a result of their inability to remit their backlog, which is with the commercial banks, we need to be clear. Now we're making reference to the foreign airlines. We're making reference to the foreign airlines their inability to remit their backlog, which is with the commercial bank, at rates that they consider not suitable is what has made, it, made them to close what we call lower inventory. They restricted their inventory. The airlines make their money through two ways. Is it that they thrive on volume or they thrive on yield? When volume is not there, then you subject your business to what we call yield. And when you subject it to yield, it means that you will sell fewer seats at a very expensive rate. And that's why you found out that the price of uh, international tickets, economic class, has gone as high as 3.5, 3.7. Who has been able to sit down to work out the airfare, how they arrived at that 3.5? Nobody's talking about that. So at that 3.5, not only as an airline you're making profit, but you are making more than enough as a result of the losses you have incurred because they are not even sure if future FX is going to be possible. And that made them to recoup some of their losses. So the question now is this. If you've been able to do that, then there's no need making noise that you still have backlog. If you have any airlines coming out to say they have backlog, then let them come to the air just like I have done this morning to say, we have so so, so backlog, and with this backlog, it's been impossible. Or maybe we'll set up uh, an audit uh, uh, committee to, re to look into how they came about this backlog. I think it will make things a lot easier for the entire uh, public, as well as the aviation experts. But we sitting back saying that, oh, we don't want to, uh, we have a backlog. If we don't cut our losses, we're gonna be making a lot of losses. How come all of a sudden, the prices of airfare has gone down? Have you asked yourself what could be responsible for that? Number one, there's a new, a new entry into a major route, which means that all, all, the, all the people... One, one, one of the things you must understand is this. There are two major destinations that Nigerian flight you supply to. Number one was Dubai. Dubai has been out of the place for a while now, so we've resulted to our London route. So the UK route is where a lot of them used to uh, mark their airfare. Now, airfares has gone, come into that space with a direct flight that will not cause any layover in any other country. The price has dropped. Why? What happened? Is there a magic around that? I mean, we should be able to question that. What made the prices to drop? And I think the, the, the chairman of EPIS has come out to say to you that, look, 
all of a sudden the prices have dropped. The prices will drop as long as we have another source of supply that is different from the conventional one. The supply that we have that is airpiece, that is a direct flight, a daily flight, would definitely put pressure on every other other routes. So all the online airlines, they're forced to 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 they're forced to quickly make an adjustment, or they'll be out of the market in no time. So, Mr. Bennett, let, let's come back to the local market, which uh, comparatively, uh, from where it was to where it is now, the airlines uh, F ticket are pretty expensive. And if some of these guys um, are worried over this environment, what exactly is the proposition to the government to help? Because technically the roads are not as safe as they used to be before. And if we have more people flying, it will guarantee the sustainability of that space. Uh, besides all the argument as to this, that, or the other about getting access to foreign exchange and all of this to buy and maintain things. So, my question directly is what can be done further to help even the local flights within nigeria to even be more affordable given the state of our nation and helping these industry players uh, to stay in business it is very simple uh, the word subsidy is not my local dialect uh, language it's not subsidy is not a word that is generated in nigeria it means it's an international word. And as an international word, it means that subsidy is being practiced everywhere around the world. Subsidy is being practiced, if subsidy is being practiced everywhere around the world, Nigeria is an oil producing country. So what we should be asking ourselves is this, how can we make addition fuel available to our local airline so that it reduces the pressure on the price of local tickets that will enhance business within our country. I think that is a fantastic way to start or to look at it. How can we make Jet A1 available to our local airline at a cheaper rate so that the airfare for local travel becomes a lot easier. You will see more airlines coming to that market space. And that's the truth. We saw during festive period that the government made it possible for air transport to be cheaper so that people could go celebrate uh, um, Christmas break. What, why can't we look into the aviation industry? Aviation has always been seen with or rather Air transport has always been seen as a luxury. And today, I can say to you, air, air, air transport is no longer a, a luxury, but a necessity as it were, because our roads are not good. The fear of being kidnapped has made a lot of people resort into air transport. Why will I want to subject myself by wasting a lot of time on the road, being scared of being kidnapped to fly by air. So if the government can come to the aid of the industry by ensuring that aviation fuel prices are reasonable enough to make that sector attractive, you will see airfare drop drastically. But and it will help the common, uh, uh, the public, the traveling public to use air transport as an alternative means of transport. But Mr. Bernard, um, while that is, um, you know, that point is acknowledged about interventions from the government, some would argue that, you know, airlines must not be 100% dependent on subsidies all of the time, that they must be viable. Certainly. But, but that's one part of it. But what about the concern also about the uh, cost of doing business in dollars? Some airlines would say uh, the, uh, the aircraft is purchased in dollars, maintenance is purchased in dollars, ground services uh, is also done in dollars. Do you worry about the concern of this dollarization of the economy that some economic experts frown at. Can there be an alternative way of doing things in addition to bringing down the cost of jet A1 fuel for airline operators? 
Well, unfortunately, um, air transport and aviation, it is not a local thing that is subject to a country, a particular country. And that's why we have an international body like ICAO regulating and seeing into um, air safety and security of um, um, a lot of countries. What about? And that's why a country like Nigeria is a member. Mr. Now, Bernard. Dollar, the dollarization of the industry is inevitable. Everything about the industry is done in dollars. Let's be sincere. Mr. That's Pardon that. me if, if the, I may uh, come uh, in uh, there. Mr. Bernard, what about the part of the business that is done in Nigeria? Should it also be dollarized? It's very, it's very, the part of the business that is done in Nigeria is very minimal. And you and I know that almost 80 to 90 percent of, of, our, of our consumptions are imported. You know that. And the reason we cannot, the fabric that I'm wearing, is it, is it produced in Nigeria? Of course not. But this is a local attire. But guess what? The only way is we, 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 we are import dependent because to produce locally is more, even more expensive. Not to now talk of an industry that is dollar based. So it's not a matter of we cannot dollarize our economy. We are talking about aviation here. The aircraft are not being manufactured in Nigeria. Right. Even the leasing companies, they are outside Nigeria. Right? The spare parts are imported. Right. Not, not locally made. Even some of those trainings and the MROs, they are all done outside the country. So it means that there's going to be a pressure, no matter what the uh, uh, um, the local airlines are doing, they are subjected to uh, changing this money to dollar to be able to meet their contingent liability by ensuring that for their the operations to continue, right. they must be able to have access to dollar. So they, it, it's inevitable. Well, How can the government help? The government needs to look into the policies that governs this particular industry. And as There's we, absolutely nothing things down, yeah. wrong in setting up MROs. If you have MROs, it means some of the checks that is being done outside the country on the aircraft will be done locally. It means the pressure of FX will become reduced. Now, right. Mr. Bernard, the of I, I, I know, I know uh, this is parts, your forte. The aircraft parts, the aircraft parts, can be imported into the country with reduced duty all right. or without duty at all to make things easier for the end users who are the passengers. All right. so that's why I keep laying emphasis on the policy. Well, Mr. The Bernard, policy is very important. Uh, let, let me just we come in here. Right um, policy it. I know we could have this conversation all day. I mean, this is your area of forte and this is a, a sector that you have studied and actively participated in for years. For a lot of people who are wondering what is MRO, I think it means maintenance, repairs, and operations. So exactly. <laughs> so we don't get them lost here. But on a final note, people, you, uh, too, you, are, you are keeping up with it. That's it's why true. it's good to speak with people like you. Uh, but you, you know, when you talk about government support, it's important to also talk about it not just in terms of funding. There's also the enabling environment and you know we've heard some of these airlines talk about how tough it is working with uh, you know the civil servants sometimes to regulators and it looks like they're obviously standing in your way and you're thinking well yes it is a business but it's a business that is meant to improve the economy so how about we work together rather than working at loggerheads i know you've heard you must have heard that narrative so if you want to speak to government as well in that area. Well, the Minister of Aviation has been quite upbeat. I mean, people have seen him do even doing videos about aircraft and showing what is possible with aircraft. So you can see the enthusiasm and all of that. But let's trickle it down to the, envir the working environment when it comes to interfacing with civil servants and the rest. What needs to be done better, Mr. Bernard, on a final note? The, the, the civil servants in the aviation sector are not different from the civil servants in every industry within Nigeria. So it means that they will always be there and there's nothing you and I can do about it. But the question, how do we walk around it? Number one, to work in certain areas in the aviation industry requires certain licenses. 
Like for me, I have an aviation school where we train cabin crew, ab initio, as well as flight dispatch. And when we're done with the training, right, NCA, which is the regulatory body, takes up the pain of conducting proper exams for the students before they can go into the industry. It means that the industry is well regulated for safety. So the so-called students, some of them end up working with the regulators as well. So the question now is, this, why can't we maintain that same level of standard with the civil servants in the aviation industry? I think the minister coming from another industry needs to first of all continue what in the preceded, preceded, uh, preceded did in terms of engaging <clears throat> the stakeholders. All right. There should be a stakeholders forum to okay. help him understand the major challenges within the industry that will lead into formulating the right policy that will help the industry move to the next level. All right, we so cannot continue to pay lip service and expect that things will change. Civil servants will continue to be civil servants, but we must make a conscious effort to say we want to change the narrative in, a, in an industry that is well regulated. I hope you know that <coughs> aside banking industry, airline um, aviation industry is one of the most regulated and it's because of the safety and uh, security standard they have to keep to. Right, Otherwise, the international examiner, which is ICAO, is going to visit and look at what we've done right and what, and you will hear about the past month. You right. heard out what happened a few months ago when ICAO came and they said the result was not so palatable. Now, we're working hard to make sure that we increase All right. the level of security, the level of safety within our aviation space. All right, Mr. Bernard, uh, the whole idea, after all, is to ensure that these players and operators have uh, a good business or working environment, ease of doing business for them. And for those of us who are passengers and fly, who fly, uh, to make sure it's as affordable as possible. And we hope that the uh, maintenance, repair, and overhaul uh, infrastructure in I think in a quiet bomb, will come upstream so that some of the things that uh, my colleagues have been asking about will be uh, done and dusted so we can reduce costs as much as possible. But most thank you so much, Mr. Bankoli Bernard, the Chairman Association of Airline Training Organizations of Nigeria, the Chairman Airline and Passengers Joint Committee, as well as, well as the Chairman Figlo Holdings. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, that's it with the conversation about backlogs with airlines and that environment. We'll switch gears now to something quite exciting. Not that the others were not exciting, but let's, let's make it a bit mellow and uh, you know, fun as much as possible. We're talking fashion. And the person who has found expression in that space joins us in just a moment. Join us again.
Welcome back to the program. So we've looked at the economy, we've looked at aviation, and you know the sustainability of policy encourages the creative sector to thrive. You know, but one business brand that is thriving against all odds is, you know, one that we'll be celebrating in this segment today. And we have joining us Mr. Adebu Soye Solomon Ayokunle is the CEO Kelala. Films. Welcome to the morning brief. Good morning, all. Good morning, viewers. Thank yes. you so much. Yes, indeed. Thank I you feel, so much for joining us. Thank you. I feel blessed. Yeah. You know, Cardi was not exaggerating when he says that your name ties perfectly mm. to Ulala, mm, the exclamation. Right. <laughs> because I spent time looking at some of your images um, mm. over the night, and you know, I was enraptured wow. in looking at them uh, you know it's like a spell that just keeps you there and mm. i ended up spending more time <laughs> mm. watching the images than i planned now, now, so, now is where you slept late oh coyote <laughs> let's not go there so really I, i'm wondering what goes how does your mind work what goes through your mind when you see your subject and you're set to actualize it what goes through your mind yeah um i feel i feel blessed i feel the skills and um, the, the technical skills, the interpersonal skills um, able to put together. And um, the idea, ideology behind my business, because um, I'm this photographer that I've trained a whole lot of people, even one of your staff here, Dari, mm. was, one of my, was once my student. So I've trained a lot of people to start their home business and thrive and become a better person in the industry. I'm someone that believes in um, Nigeria. I choose to live here. And um, the way I run the business with sisterly kind of business that can lean on each other, like not just a photographer, but also a cinematographer. We have a mobile studio that we can, you can call us within a few minutes. We bring down our mobile studio, get those shot down and, you know, we, have, we do drone piloting. I have a standard academy for photography and cinematography. And these have really, really put a whole lot of success into the business and um, anytime I see all this, my heart gladdens and I'm happy. And I tell myself, oh boy, you are doing well. And Nigeria is the place to stay. <laughs> and and you, you do a, a, an amazing job of telling stories, you know, mm. really, not just with photography, mm. but with film, the way your images dissolve. You know, what's the potential there of telling stories, not just, you know, with those uh, events, but with the, the culture the entire, uh, you know, gamut of Nigeria's culture, what's the potential there, you know, of using um, what you're doing, your creativity, to tell the Nigerian story, particularly selling it abroad? Yes, um, you know, Nigeria is blessed with colors, cultures, traditions. When you see, um, when you go to our wedding, uh, weddings, you see the Edo's, uh, culturally blessed with beads, mm -hmm. colorful beads, and their attire. You see what they wear on it and all. You see the Igbos with the Okuku and all and all. You see the Yorubas and Ashoke and all of this and all that. So this, these are things that um, cameras love, colors. They love colors, we embrace colors. And um, it has really added a lot to our pictures, our images. And um, these colors are attracting. You love them. You can just look at that. Green, mm. green, you know what green emerges? Uh, it, it, green says a lot, it tells a lot of stories and all. So, this is one of the things that really um, put us out there, and it's, it's colorfully made. We get it captions and get us images, work on it, and we put them out there, and all looks fly and interesting. Well, we'll come, we'll come to the economy of photography, really, because as a lot of people have seen these images, they are calculating how much it will cost <laughs> <laughs> to get your services. But you have a very interesting business model. Thank and, you. And um, that's what we want to also talk about, so we can empower other business owners so they can learn from this and hopefully replicate it in their business. You've been around, at least in Nigeria, for over 10 years. Oh, more than, oh, more than, yeah, 14 years. 14 um, years, yes. fantastic. You moved from the United States. Yes. Where you used to do photography as well. Yes. But interestingly, your model here is, you're not exactly the one that 
shoot. You're not the sniper. Yes. You don't yes. pull the trigger yes. in this case. I don't. You have people shooting right. for you instead. Yes. And that's very interesting because for businesses like yours, mm. people always say, I want Kilala. It has to be him. Don't send another boy. Mm. Don't send your guy. Mm. It has to be you. Mm. Makeup artists as well. They want that name, mm. that brand. Mm. It could be a videographer too. They want the person. Mm. But you have been able to sort of remove yourself, mm. yet it is Kelala. Mm. How did, how were you able to achieve that? Right. So the first thing I did was, um, when I started, it was really tough. Number one, nobody cares about you, nobody believes in you. If you don't have a name, nobody wants to approach you, nobody wants to use you, and sometimes you can't really blame them. They don't want to get into the wrong hands. Yeah. So the first thing I did was um, build the name, build a brand. I built a team, I trained them very well, and um, we do a lot of practicals with um, collaborations and all that. So after building that, then um, I started pushing. It was really, really tough to uh, connect with the world, to tell people I'm good, I can do this. There are a lot of um, event planners that don't believe in you. I've heard a lot, I'll say, um, what kind of cam camera do you use? I'll say, I use this, so say, oh, come on, my photographer is better. So I was trying to see how I can get myself into the market, and it was really, really tough. Nobody cares about me, nobody believed in me. So what I started doing then was, um, after building my team, I started, I just told myself, how can I meet up with my immediate customer, people that need my service? And I pinned down, number one, Event planners can recommend you, but they don't believe in me because they don't know me. They don't know how, what I'm capable of doing. And um, I now pin down event halls. Then there's nothing like social media and all and all. And what I'll do is in the morning, I'll wake up and I listed all the great um, event centers around this neighborhood. Right. And I'll walk down there. I've built some, I've printed some beautiful albums with some weddings we've done in the past, and they look so great. And I wait, and I know everybody that gets into this hall and coming out is likely to come and book the hall. So the moment you step out, I just walk down to you, oh, good morning, ma, I'm a photographer, and these are my services, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, some will stay, and some will like, oh, what is this? And some will think you want to, you are here to beg for money. But the moment you say anything, I just market my business and I have those attractive albums to show. The moment they f set their eyes on you, say, okay, what do you do? I just run a profile of what I do and all. Some will like, okay, let me have your card. Some will get my number. And that is how I started building the name, the brand, From the scratch. one by one, yes. And at a point, I made it a point of duty to get at least, I give myself a target to meet up with at least seven customers in a day. So when I leave this all, I'll run to the other hall. When I leave this hall, I'll run to the other hall. Then there's nothing like social media and all and all. So I started building this and all and all. Then my team, we got the first job, we went, my team went, they covered it, and it came out real good. And the customer called me, oh, but you didn't come. I said, yes, I stay back to edit. Because one of the problems for um, which photographer, some photographers is, they will shoot, they will also edit. Right. And it takes a whole lot of time. Editing, editing takes a whole lot of time, and it's always been a problem for turnaround time and all. So I stay back to edit while my team shoots. And um, before you know it, you are back from jo your job on Saturday, Sunday evening, your pictures are out. Oh wow, they love it and they love the idea. So they start recommending us. We solely believe in and um, key into our customers, give them the best so that they can tell others about the quality of their services. <clears throat> so they tell others about the quality of their services and this really, really helped us to grow. And um, when it went down, the social media now became a thing of, that's come to stay. I told myself that well, the world has changed. Mm -hmm. It's now a uh, smartphone world and internet world. So I started, posting on Instagram. My very first picture I posted on Instagram was really nice. And I just saw it everywhere. And I didn't, I didn't remember to put my name. <laughs> you didn't want so to nobody, they, didn't, they didn't even tag me <laughs> and all. So after that, oh, I learned, I show watermark. I watermark, I post. And honestly, I don't know, I, think, I can say kudos to Bella Naja. They've been really, really helpful. They've helped a whole lot of business to strive to stay and haul. Because like Instagram, for example, among the other social media, has really, really helped the photography and cinematography industry to grow. The likes of business like that will never ask you for money. They, when they like your pictures, when your images come out real good, clean and sharp, they post for you. 
So, so all, of, all of this you're saying, everybody's thinking, how much can this guy, how much does he really charge? So maybe we'll get to that uh, conversation in terms of the curiosity that people are having. Um, an average uh, session, I don't know how you do your, your charges, but when we ask questions about money, a lot of people seem to be shy to ask them. But you can give us a range because <laughs> uh, the pictures are great. And we also notice that for every picture, you seem to have a narrative. Is that also a selling point for you? Because I'm looking at one here. I think it's this one, not this one, not this one. There's another one. Like a faithful shadow, my love will accompany you everywhere you tread. It's one of the brightest pictures mm -hmm. there. So I think it, one of those pictures. Mm -hmm. So is, is that like your own marketing gimmick as well? Besides, so two questions I've asked. Okay. Your narrative, is it part of your selling point? Mm -hmm. And uh, averagely, what does it go for? Okay, yes, yes. Uh, photography is all about telling stories mm -hmm. and um, different mindsets, different people can say a whole lot about a picture, even more than you can see. But for you as a photographer, you have a story behind every picture. That's there. Then um, for what we charge is photography is not cheap at all. There's a lens um, I bought recently. I bought this lens like three years ago for 2.9 million. And today it's selling for 5.6 million. So it's not cheap at all. The gears are very expensive and you need to have the best equipment so that your images can come out well and you can have the best out there in terms of resolution, in terms of images and all and all. So it's, um, we, 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 we try to stay in between. We don't want to be too expensive and we don't want to be too... So our charges is... Um, we have different packages. Nice. We have the silver package that would... Um, go with the normal, the average people, where we have the gold package that will also meet up, then we have the platinum packing for those. I can see that trick you're playing on us. <laughs> so the morning brief will take the gold package uh, with the benefit of having interviewed you. you know. Jeffrey Cardi yes. and Bukala will just come for a oh, photo yes. shoot. Uh, that, that would be come nice. On. That would be nice. It would be nice to have you. We, we wouldn't need to sign any check. Yes, we, we know. It would be too nice to have you. This is a new quarter, new Bukala. <laughs> I, I can see it. it just, instead of giving me the prize, it just yeah. give us the book. Okay, so <laughs> fix for yourself where you can, where you can what come can in afford, eventually. Yes. But I get your point really about how photography is not cheap, particularly amid uh, you know, the current economic realities. But talk to us also about, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the potential of exportation of your business. You say your business runs independent of you and you've had the benefit of travel. You know, but you know Nigerians have this... Um, um, extravagance, you know, they like to loud their celebrations, weddings, uh, anniversaries, birthdays. But do you find the same to be the attitude of ceremony in the West? Do they um, invest that much in preserving memories the way Nigerians do, and perhaps maybe in other African countries where you have worked? Um, because because of the memorable attachment that photography and cinematography has. The most important part of your wedding is your photography and cinematography, because it brings back the memories. There's been a whole lot of time that um, our clients will call us like, sorry, can you play back a video? Someone stole something or something happened. We want to see behind the scene. Oh. And there's been a lot of time that we're able to play back and were able to trace one or two things. Oh, this was the last person I heard, I was here, this happened here, this happened here, and all and all. So, the photography and um, cinematography bring back memories. And um, in this part of the world, people love to go out of their way, out of, they want to just, they want the best. Once you're able to project yourself on that level, people don't care how much you charge. They just want the best, and they're ready to pay for it. And, um, Nigerian like, we like extravagant weddings, and um, we want to see our weddings just everywhere and all that. And um, they pay well because people save for their wedding, people borrow money for their wedding, people get sponsors for their wedding, and there's there's, there's a certain amount that is dedicated that is being budgeted for photography for us. And um, so people don't play at all when it comes to photography and cinematography. Because um, a whole lot I've learned, like, 
probably your cousin did his wedding. The photographer has not delivered up to date. You hear like camera got broken, got stolen, stuff happened. These are memories for great grandchildren to see. These are memories that has come to stay forever. So a whole lot of people have learned. And then the, the use of social media has really helped a lot of people to put a lot of stories out there. Unlike those days that it happens to you, you can't say it out. But today, you just read stories like my photographer carrying my picture, I never mm -hmm. see I'm up to date to, you know, stuff and all and all. So people learn to go for the best that would, um, not just a wedding photographer, not just a photographer, but a professional wedding photographer when it comes to wedding or events photographer that can document your events and um, weddings properly. So in this part of the world, people pay very well. And but outside, uh, outside the world, yeah. yes, they pay a lot too. They pay a whole lot. So the ecosystem that you're operating, mm -hmm. how... Re how collaborative are you guys? Just in 30 seconds, there are so many photographers in the space. So do you guys collaborate? Do you, what do you do uh, to make sure that the interest of photography is protected? Or you're thriving, so if any other person is not thriving, that's their business. What exactly works for the space? Right, okay, for... In 30 seconds, okay. we're totally out of time. Okay, good. For me, um... I'm like, um, I'm like a king for other photographers. They call me king of photography because I've been able to create a niche. I've been able to do a whole lot in the industry. And a lot of photographers come to me, seek advice on growth and sustainability. And when it comes to growth and sustainability, I'm one of the best. Because um, I've really been able to turn around, take my business from point A to point B, and I've been able to sustain the business without going down. So I help a whole lot of photographers. I can't mention them, they come to me, they see me like their father, and I give proper advice. I'll do like, um, um, how do I put it? Do a check and kind of, um, I just put, I, I make sure I put in my best mm. to, grow your, to grow your business. You ask questions and I tell you how to go about it and it's really been working. And they'll come with wines and drinks and we celebrate each other. We love each other, we embrace each other. <laughs> like and I've been speed. looking out for your best friend, you know, by the way, which would be your camera so that you can preserve this memory or this edition of the morning brief this day the 2nd of april but maybe we'll do that after this time out we want to thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much mr adebusoye solomon so, ayokole so ceo I really this. K La La films thank you so much thank yeah. you so much it's my pleasure being here. honestly and i must commend your dressing you know you get to a point <laughs> in life where you can dress this way because yeah. your business is running well without right. you so business owners out there this is a model you can also cop absolutely works. I agree with you, Kennedy. He doesn't look like a photographer. He looks like a young man in early retirement. Wow. <laughs> like you golf with that. Yeah, so do the work so that you can also be a good Nigerian, young Nigerian in early retirement. Thank you so much for watching The Morning Brief this morning. We'll be back again tomorrow. I am Bukola Koka. Sunrise Daily is next. Thank you for your company and your time. I'm Jeffrey Uzonga. Yeah, something special happened with Sunrise Daily. At least somebody on Sunrise Daily. But we'll let the cat out of the bag. Watch the show in just a few minutes. I'm Kaido Kikili. Goodbye.